Some machines earn their place in history through design, others through efficiency, and then there are those that simply overwhelm everything in their path. The Letourneau tree crushers belong firmly in that last category. These diesel-electric behemoths rolled through dense forests like forces of nature, snapping trees, pulverizing stumps, and leaving behind nothing but flattened debris. Standing over 20 feet tall and weighing up to 175 tons, they represented engineering ambition pushed to its absolute extreme. They served in British Columbia's wilderness and the jungles of Vietnam. Though only a handful were ever built, their legacy endures as some of the most extraordinary land-clearing equipment ever conceived. Robert Gilmore Letourneau was born in Vermont in 1888 and dropped out of school before finishing sixth grade. What he lacked in formal education, he made up for with an almost supernatural ability to move earth. After years working odd jobs, Letourneau discovered his calling in 1919 when he repaired an old Holt scraper in California. That broken machine changed his life. He became obsessed with moving dirt, lots of it, and doing so faster and cheaper than anyone thought possible. In 1929, he incorporated R.G. Letourneau, Incorporated in Stockton, California. Over the following decades, the firm would secure nearly 300 patents and revolutionize the earth-moving industry. Letourneau pioneered rubber-tired scrapers, developed the two-wheeled Tornapool tractor, and perfected diesel-electric drive systems. During World War II, his factories produced an estimated 70% of the heavy earth-moving equipment used by Allied forces. By the 1950s, he had sold his business to Westinghouse Airbrake for $31 million. But retirement didn't suit him. At age 70, he re-entered the equipment business from Longview, Texas, focusing on even larger machines. His motto said it all, your job's not too big, your machines are too small. While bulldozers excelled at moving soil, dense forests presented a different challenge. Traditional clearing methods Chainsaws, controlled burns, and standard dozers worked, but they were slow and labor-intensive. Letourneau saw an opportunity. What if a machine could simply drive through a forest and flatten everything in its path? In an era of massive hydroelectric projects and military operations requiring rapid land clearance, the idea found buyers. His solution was elegant in its brutality. Instead of tracks or wheels, the tree crushers rode on massive steel rollers equipped with protruding grouses, essentially enormous spiked drums. A heavy push bar would topple trees forward. The giant rollers would then pass over the fallen timber, crushing and splintering it into the ground. The diesel engines didn't power the rollers directly. Instead, they drove generators that produced electricity, which then powered motors mounted inside each roller. This diesel-electric arrangement eliminated complex mechanical drivetrains and delivered tremendous torque smoothly. The most famous tree crusher was the G175, built for a massive land-clearing project in British Columbia. In the early 1960s, construction began on the WAC Bennett Dam on the Peace River. When completed in 1968, the 186-metre-high dam would create the Williston Reservoir the largest body of fresh water in British Columbia. The reservoir would eventually cover 1,800 square kilometers of forest land. Before flooding, vast areas of non-merchantable timber needed clearing. Much of this forest couldn't be economically logged, but standing timber would create hazards once submerged. The G175 specifications were staggering. The machine measured 56 feet long, 35 feet wide, and stood 21 feet tall. It weighed 175 tons. Power came from two Cummins diesel engines producing a combined 1,400 horsepower. Each drum was equipped with six-inch steel grousers that would rip and destroy fallen trees. The frame was entirely welded steel, and simple fingertip controls allowed a single operator to guide this mechanical monster through the wilderness. On November 9, 1964, the 175 arrived at Kennedy Siding in northern British Columbia aboard six flatbed rail cars. Reassembly took four days. Then the problems began. From November 21st to December 9th, crews attempted to move the massive machine from its assembly point to the work area. 
The journey was only supposed to cover four miles. It proved far more difficult than anticipated. The monster got stuck, repeatedly. The same tremendous weight that allowed it to crush trees also caused it to sink into soft ground. After traveling only two and a half miles, winter arrived and forced a halt. The machine sat abandoned in the bush until spring. The summer of 1965 brought more frustration. Mechanical failures plagued the crusher. It became mired in mud multiple times. From mid-May through the end of July, the G-175 managed to clear only 340 acres, far below expectations. But something changed in late summer. Production increased dramatically. The operation began functioning smoothly. From August 1st to November 17th, the tree crusher downed an impressive 2,250 acres before shutting down for winter. In total, the beast cleared over 2,500 acres of forest along the Finlay and Parsnip rivers before the rising waters of Williston Reservoir made further work unnecessary. It was the only self-powered tree-crushing machine of its size ever built for civilian use. Then it sat. For nearly 20 years, the strange-looking machine remained parked in the bush near Cut Thumb Creek, slowly rusting and being reclaimed by the very forest it had once dominated. While the 175 battled British Columbia's wilderness, another variant was being developed for military purposes. In Vietnam, American forces faced a strategic nightmare. Dense jungle provided perfect concealment for Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops who used the triple canopy forest to hide bases, protect supply lines and stage ambushes. As early as November 1965, General William Westmoreland ordered his staff to explore jungle clearing solutions. The military tried herbicides like Agent Orange, incendiary bombs, and specialized bulldozers called Rome plows, modified caterpillar tractors with angled cutting blades. Rome plow units eventually cleared over 300,000 acres during the war. But the army also showed interest in something more dramatic. Letourneau's transphibian tactical tree crusher weighed approximately 60 tons and rode on three five-bladed steel drums, two at the front and one at the rear for steering. The drums were hollow and foam-filled, providing buoyancy for crossing rivers and swamps. A push bar would knock trees down as the vehicle advanced. The sharp-edged drums would then crush the fallen timber, leaving a compacted trail of debris. In 1968, the army leased two transphibian tree crushers from Letourneau and shipped them to South Vietnam. A provisional unit was established in July 1967 to train crews and begin clearing around Long Bin, northeast of Saigon. Three months later, the machines joined the 93rd Engineer Battalion at Bear Cat. The results were impressive. The two crushers cleared more than 2,000 acres around Long Bin during initial testing, then leveled nearly another 1,200 acres with the 93rd. Under optimal conditions, a single tree crusher could clear four acres per hour. 32 in a workday. A Rome plow unit with 30 bulldozers might clear 150 to 200 acres daily, meaning each crusher matched roughly five conventional machines. Trees up to three feet in diameter presented little obstacle. The crushers plowed through dense timber without hesitation. But Vietnam's jungles were not British Columbia's forests and the tactical crushers had serious problems. Their tall profile made them obvious targets. The enemy could spot them from far away. Water-cooled engines would fail if cooling systems took damage. Electrical components flooded easily in swampy terrain. The weight that made crushers effective at flattening trees also meant they got stuck constantly. The unit's truck-mounted crane was inadequate for recovery. Most critically, crews had no defenses. The army didn't even assign weapons to the unit for the first five months. In April 1968, the army returned both machines with a list of suggested modifications. Lower profile, 12-pointed wheels, air-cooled engines, reorganized wiring, an armored turret with a 50 caliber machine gun, and claymore mines on the sides. The military wasn't interested. Agent Orange and Rome plows were cheaper and already effective. The tactical tree crusher program ended. The two tactical crushers that served in Vietnam returned to Longview, Texas. Today, what remains sits behind a workshop, rusted cabs and partially scrapped drums slowly deteriorating. 
A salvage operator once attempted to cut up the drums for scrap, only to discover the foam inside was toxic. The cutting stopped, leaving them partially sectioned and abandoned. The G175 had somewhat of a better fate. For years, Mackenzie residents discussed relocating the giant machine from its remote resting place. On May 28, 1984, the Municipal Council appointed a tree crusher committee led by Arnold Boomhauer to make it happen. On October 19, 1984, two cranes loaded the 175, disassembled into six pieces, onto flatbed trucks. The convoy wound its way 38.5 miles down the Parsnip Forest Service Road. Today, the legendary piece of iron sits at Mackenzie's entrance along Highway 39, proudly displayed as a roadside attraction. It holds the unofficial title of world's largest tree crusher, because nothing else like it exists anywhere. In 2011, during a Hockeyville celebration, locals even decorated it to look like the world's largest Zamboni. Robert Letourneau passed away in June 1969, months after the Vietnam program ended. His firm continued under various owners, Marathon Manufacturing in 1972, Rowan Companies in 1986, and Joy Global in 2011. Joy Global was absorbed by Komatsu Mining in 2017. None manufacture tree crushers today. The concept has largely disappeared from the industry. Modern land clearing relies on excavators, mulchers, and conventional dozers. Environmental regulations have transformed how forests are managed. The era of overwhelming nature with sheer mechanical force has passed. But standing in Mackenzie, British Columbia, the G175 remains, a rusting monument to a time when engineers believed no job was too big, only that machines were too small. Every visitor who drives into town passes the enormous steel rollers, the towering frame, the massive drums that once flattened everything in their path. It was a different age, when men dreamed of taming wilderness with steel and diesel power, when forests were obstacles to be conquered rather than ecosystems to be preserved. The Letourneau tree crushers embodied that philosophy perfectly. They were simply out of this world, 